I am Javier Avila, and I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And all my life in Puerto Rico, I was white. I was born, my aunts and cousins looked at me and said, Pero mira que lindo, que blanquito ese bebé. And I grew up blanquito. I saw the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze, and I thought I was Patrick Swayze. A friend of mine from Pennsylvania said, Dude, you are not Patrick Swayze. You're the Puerto Rican guy who killed Patrick Swayze. You're Willie Lopez. What? Because I thought the only dark person in my family was my dad who was a, just a tiny bit of a shade darker than I. My mom would call my dad negro, which means literally black man, but it is a term of endearment. In Puerto Rico, it means sweetheart or honey. But I thought when I was little, bueno, papi es negro, pero yo no. I wrote my dad a Christmas card when I was six years old, and it read, papi, tú eres chocolate. Pero como quiera, te quiero. Translation, Daddy, you are chocolate, but I love you anyway. So as you can see, at that young age, I was indeed a little racist. But life has a way of presenting irony to all of us. And 30 years after I wrote my dad that Christmas card, I became the dark one in my family. There is a formula for that. You marry a white woman, and then you go ahead and have a whiteino child. And that makes you understand the fallacy of race. Otherwise, how is it possible for me to be white one day, brown the next day, and be exactly the same person with the same value and the same values? So that was a bubble that needed to burst in my life, the bubble of race. Another bubble, my concept of parental sleeping arrangements. My parents slept in separate beds. My mom in a big bed in the center of the room, my dad in a tiny twin bed in the corner of the room, and he had the sheets wrapped around him very tightly like a burrito. And to us, to me, that was normal. Whatever happens to you when you're little, you think is normal. Then I remember going to a friend's house for my first sleepover, and my friend's giving me a tour of the house, and we get to his parents' bedroom, and I am in shock to see one bed. So I asked my friend, Ruben, where does your dad sleep? You know? And that's when he explained to me that my parents were weird and that the Flintstones arrangement that they had was not normal. I asked my mom that night, Mommy, ¿por qué tú y papi, why do you sleep in separate beds? And she says, oh, mijo, your dad is a violent sleeper. And the first night that we spent in the same bed together, in his sleep, he punched and kicked me out of bed. And I said, Negro, no, 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 no. Tú tienes que tener tu camita. You got to get your own bed. This cannot be. But I didn't know why that was the case of my father's violent sleeping until I was a teenager, when I discovered that my dad, back in 1951, when he was 19 years old, he, as a member of the US Army, went to fight for our country in the Korean War. And the things he experienced as a member of the Borinqueneers, a segregated military unit. Segregated because at that time, Puerto Rican soldiers were not allowed to fight alongside white soldiers. What he experienced traumatized him for life. And that includes having his best friend die in his arms. His best friend by the name of Carlos, and he, named, uh, he called him Carlitos. So every night, you would hear him yell, Carlitos, Carlitos, no. And I thought Carlitos was an imaginary friend. And that was not the case. So you see, when people exhibit weird behaviors such as sleeping separately, which actually is good for a marriage in many cases, uh, there's a reason behind it. And we must acquire the empathy to understand that. The third bubble is the bubble of language. I grew up in Puerto Rico where everybody's first language is Espanol. Spanish is my first language. But I went to a school where all instruction was in English, a private Military, Catholic Academy. I have suffered, okay? But um, the thing about that is that it made my reality in Puerto Rico different from most people's reality, but I did not know it. So I would speak English at school, Spanish at home, and Spanglish everywhere else, and to me that was normal. 
And then I went to the University of Puerto Rico, where all instruction, for, with the exception of English classes, all instruction was in Spanish. And I start speaking my Spanglish to my friends, and they make fun of me. They think I'm uppity. And they say, pero mira este tipo, se cree que es gringo. Look at this guy, he thinks he's an American speaking English like that. And that offended me. And I thought, you know what? If people here in Puerto Rico don't appreciate me speaking another language, surely in Pennsylvania they will. Well, something could happen if you are caught in public speaking Spanish while brown. Hopefully nothing. But every now and then someone will say, you know what, you should not speak Spanish here, you should speak uh, American, I guess. Or someone might say, go back to your country. And this is what I do if someone ever tells me to go back to my country. I'm back. Because this is my country too. And maybe they'll hold up a sign that says, this is our country, speak English only. And they will misspell the word our. Because one thing that I've learned through the years is that a good racist can hate much better than he can spell. But it may happen. And it happened to me a few years ago in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, when I was with a good friend of mine. We're both college professors. And we are speaking Spanish at the entrance of the restaurant. And the waitress said something that at the time, because I was a little shocked, I didn't react. So I did what I always do when I get frustrated, and I, I wrote about it. So um, I'm going to share this, the first poem with you, and it's entitled, Denied Service. Upon being heard speaking Spanish at the entrance of a restaurant in Hazleton, PA. Should I have told the waitress that my father never had a good night's sleep, that he was haunted by recurrent nightmares after that day when he, a young man with stripes on his shoulders, led Private Diaz and Private Gonzalez to the safety of the trenches and rescued Corporal Murphy, Private Williams, and Private First Class de Leon from the hovering claws of tanks and gunfire before he tried and failed to save Private Rivera. 20-year-old Carlos Rivera, Carlitos, beloved father of newborn Maria Rivera, to whom he promised to return safely from Korea, my father, deafened by the shots, the shrieks of torture, the agony of oscillating bullets, dragged Carlitos body through smoke and ashes saw the blood run in rivulets over the mud, the tourniquet was not enough to stop the flow, and as Calitos bled to death, my father said, hold on, my friend, aguanta, que pronto salimos de esto. But they would not get out in time for life, and for Calitos, who whispered, mi Maria, as his last breath, that would be it. This cross my father carried with him every day. Should I have told the waitress that my uncle lost both legs in Vietnam, and that the phantom pain no morphine could erase the throbbing of the stumps, the constant pounding, sharp like a tornado, relentless like the memory of war, would follow him throughout the bitter journey from opium to Prozac. And a decade after his return to the island, he still assured my mother that the American Military Academy was the best choice for me to learn the discipline of service. Should I have told the waitress that both my father and my uncle, who worked for the federal government, died in the same veterans hospital in Guaynabo the same year my cousin enlisted in the US Marine Corps? Should I have told the waitress that after years with the junior ROTC insignia on my sleeve and a bilingual education on the island that Spain forgot, I now teach English to native English speakers in North America, the English that I learned in the Caribbean, specifically the US Commonwealth. Yes, a Commonwealth like the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, where I was born and raised. Should I have told the waitress that having this skin that white people pay good money for at the tanning salon is not a crime? That saying salud instead of bless you when someone sneezes is not a crime. 
that greeting friends with a kiss instead of a handshake is not a crime. That teaching Spanish to my son, who calls the mainland home, is not a crime. That I cannot remove the platano stain on his back, nor would I want to, because he is the grandson of Sergeant Avila, who sacrificed his health for us, who didn't let Carlitos die in vain, who taught me well the value of silence and of words, who knew since he was the same age as this woman, who has already judged me, that there are things in this world that cannot be denied. Soy ciudadano de los Estados Unidos y soy puertorriqueño. Should I have told the waitress anything when she called me a foreigner? Thank you. When I take a break and have a water specially delivered to me by Dr. Carter from the Potomac River, it's a little metallic. I can taste. It's gamey. It's gamey water. It's gamey. So maybe human remains. I, I'm not sure, but he said this is the best water we have in Virginia. So I'm having it. I was not always considered a minority. Because for the first 31 years of my life, I lived in Puerto Rico, where most people kind of look like this, a little shade lighter or uh, darker. So I did not know, I did not understand what it was like to be in the minority. And what I realized when I moved to Pennsylvania is that when you are in the minority, one of the burdens is that you constantly have to prove to the majority that you are not the stereotype that they have of you. And that can be exhausting. Sometimes you just want to take off the mask and be invisible in a positive way, but you can't. Perhaps because that very day you smell like sofrito. And you run into someone and they say, Javier, what is that I smell? Is that cilantro? And you don't have the time to explain what recao is, so you let it go. There are indeed signs that give it away that you are, in fact, Latino or Latina. And the first sign is your name. If your name is Hermenegildo Ramirez, you are unmistakably, inconfundiblemente, undeniably Latino, right? Can't hide it. If you are a married woman from the island of Puerto Rico and you move from the island to the mainland, the trouble with your name begins. Because in Puerto Rico, women don't take their husband's last names because they don't love them. It has nothing to do with that, it's cultural. It's cultural, and actually, if you and your husband have the same last name in Puerto Rico, you may have married a blood relative. So that's how it is. My wife and I don't have the same last name, and everyone who knows us knows that. And I remember after winning a, an important award, I was invited to a fancy party in Philadelphia where I would see people who like to go to Puerto Rico to go golfing at the Hotel Conquistador. And I'm like, this is going to be great. I heard that the venue was legendary for the filet mignon with mashed potatoes. I'm like, can't miss that. We got the invitation and the envelope, it read, to Dr. and Mrs. Javier Avila. And that means, we all know what that means. That means they invited me and my wife. That's a custom. But to a Puerto Rican, that could mean at least three things. Number one, that I am both Dr and Mrs. Javier Avila. That is not the case. Number two, that I got so lucky in life that I met and married a woman with exactly my first and last name. Here's my wife, Javier Avila. Mira que linda, mira que linda. Look at her, yes. That's not the case either. Number three, which is the assumption, is that upon marriage, her last name, gone. But why not just encapsulate everything about her and just forget about her first name too and just put Mrs. Javier Avila? So, being the woman that she is, she said, I'm not going, honey. Because they know you, they know me, and this is what they wrote. You go. I'm like, oh, are you sure? It's going to be great filet. I'm like, no, no, no. You go, enjoy the filet, enjoy the potatoes. But, uh, but here, take the envelope. Took the envelope, put it in my back pocket, and went, perhaps ready to cause a little trouble. Because I'm like that. So I go there, and I shake hands with people, and there's the president of the company, and I... Uh, I say, hey, great to see you. And he says, Javier, it's great to see you. Where's your wife? I said, unfortunately, she was not invited. 
No, no, nonsense. I wrote the invitation myself. And that's when I showed him the envelope. Said, Do you see her name here? It was an awkward moment. For him, not for me. I was enjoying the mashed potatoes and believe me, the filet was delicious. And here's the thing. Every now and then, when you have to stand up for what you believe in, you're going to be met with uncomfortable silences. And you have to be ready for that. So I did that. And that happens to me maybe once a month. Um, other times, I let it go because I have to be happy and I have to live my life. But there's the name issue for you. Here is another sign that gives it away that you are indeed Latino, Latina, and that is your physical appearance. Right? I have a tan that does not go away in the winter. It stays. It was never an issue for me in Puerto Rico. My parents, my dad who was darker skin, my mom who was probably my same skin tone, uh, never felt like they did not belong in their neighborhood. And they had uh, a house in Bayamón, Puerto Rico, and they had pride of ownership where they lived. I also had pride of ownership when my wife and I bought our house in 2006 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I remember seeing the house. The rose bushes in front of the house were overgrown, and my father-in-law gave me a fantastic pair of shears. He said, Javier, use these. These are really expensive. You're going to cut those bushes like butter. It's going to be great. I'm like, yes. So I went to Home Depot. I got a pair of gloves, and I started working on my garden beautiful thing, right, when you own a new house. And I see my neighbor parking his fancy BMW across from me, across the street, and he's coming over, and I get excited. Why? Because growing up in Puerto Rico, I learned that when you move into a new neighborhood in the U.S., your neighbors get you apple pie. So I'm like, when I see this dude come over with his nice golf hat, golf shirt, I'm like, ooh, I'm going to get apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, pie de manzana, this is going to be great. I remove my glove, and we shake hands. And I say, nice to meet you, I'm Javier. He says, what a coincidence. My guy's name is Jose, but he had to go back to Mexico. Listen, Javier, when you're done with this house and this garden, could you come over to my house and do an estimate on my garden? Don't feel bad. Remember, I thought I was Patrick Swayze, okay? And I'm also a clown, so I played along with it. So I said, okay, yeah, don't worry. Your house over there, yeah? As soon as I'm done with this one. So I finished my job. I went inside into my home office. I printed out an estimate. I wrote Avila Lawn Services, and I wrote $500 an hour. So I go over there, and I knock on his door with my estimate. He said, here you go, sir. Here's your estimate. He looks at it and he says, literally, Javier, I don't know if in Puerto Rico they know about decimal points, but this should be $5 an hour, not 500 You have the dot in the wrong place. And I told him right then and there that I was his new neighbor, the owner of the house, and he felt ashamed. He felt embarrassed. He said, Javier, please, I don't want you to think that I am a racist in any way. And I said, I never thought that. I thought you were going to get me apple pie. But for whatever reason, nine years went by and we did not speak. I would wave hi when I saw him. He would just turn around and go in. And then something magical happened. In 2015, I was named Pennsylvania's Professor of the Year. I was the first Latino to win that award, the only um, and my college posted billboards of me looking like this. And it says, Javier Avila, Pennsylvania's Professor of the Year. Come to Northampton, get a great education. You know, they're, they're, they're proud of the accomplishment, but they're also selling it. Okay, fine, use me, it's fine. And of course, I was everywhere, and my neighbor saw it. So he knocks on my door. Nine years later, I open the door and I go, Oh my God, this is so great to see you. He said, let me shake your hand, Javier. I did not know I was living across from a celebrity. I'm like, I'm not really a celebrity. I'm just an educator, and this is something the college is doing um, to celebrate the accomplishment. But how great that it took this accomplishment for me to be worthy of shaking your hand. And then I was bold, and I asked, do you think I could now get that apple pie? I'm still waiting for it. So maybe one day, 
If you have any recommendations, or those of you watching online, of where to get the best apple pie in Northern Virginia, let me know, please. I want to leave this area with a good apple pie. All right? Okay, so that's physical appearance for you. So we covered name and physical appearance. Here's something that you can't see, but you can hear. Your accent. Accent. That gives it away. If you learn another language after the ideal language acquisition age, which is between age 0 and 12, if you learn another language after that, you're going to have an accent. Nothing you can do about it. It's about tongue placement, physics, habit, and sounds that exist in the arsenal of one language that don't exist in another. So that's a fact. And an accent in no way indicates any intellectual ability or lack thereof. And if people understood that, we would move along much further in society. But the problem is that people don't because they don't understand the basics of linguistics. I'll give you an example. The letter T is different in English from Spanish. In English, you, to utter that sound, you have to put the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth and you kind of like spit a little. T -t 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 time. You see? In Spanish, you put the tip of your tongue behind your front teeth and you don't spit that much. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Tiempo. So, how do you get an accent? When you say time. Or when you say tiempo, you have an accent. And if you say vieques estoy contigo, you're Ricky Martin. And we forgive Ricky Martin for his American accent because we love him. But the thing is, if you don't know anything about language acquisition, you could say something completely foolish and no one will know or correct you unless there's a bold Latino in the room. In grad school, I had a professor, let's call him Professor Murphy, because that was his name. And he was teaching us a book that had words in Spanish, a novel. And uh, every time he came across a word he didn't understand or, uh, in Spanish, he would ask me, the token Latino. He would say, Javier, what does this mean over here? And I would tell him, and he would say, yeah, I can see that. I could see that he had no dictionary, apparently. But anyway, we get to a very important scene in the book where the main character has reached the Mexican border. And Professor Murphy goes, and this is the part where our hero runs into the Jovenis. Javier! I'm like, yes, yes. Who are these Jovenis? Is this a Mexican gang? Are they going to hurt her? And I look at the page and then the word, and it says, Jovenis. The professor is not Jovenis, it's Jovenis. It means young people. She just ran into some kids. He looked at me for a while and he said, are you sure? I'm like, yes, I'm sure Spanish is my first language. And that is the first day that it hit me, that when you are in the minority, in some realms in this world, you will be asked to provide further proof that you belong where you already know you belong documentation, perhaps a birth certificate, something that proves that you are official. And I didn't understand that until that day. Joe Venice. Here's another kind of accent. Not the one you hear, but the one you see. If you have, if, if you have a Spanish name or if you have friends with Spanish names, you know that every now and then you have names that have an accent mark. El acento diacrítico, la tilde, whatever you want to call that stick that hovers over vowels to indicate emphasis on syllables. Like the name Jose has an accent right there on the E. So that you say Jose and not Jose or Jose, right? Jose. What happens to us when we move from our Latin American countries or Spanish-speaking countries to the mainland? What happens to those accent marks? They're gone. Your gun mark. The license doesn't say it anymore. The legal documents don't say it. Nothing says it. I like to honor my Hispanic students and to write that accent mark with pride. I also like to pronounce their names the way they're supposed to be pronounced so that they feel included, they feel at home. And I remember having this student in my class a few years ago. And I saw the class list, of course. I always look at the class lists 
and I practice. I go on YouTube and I say pronunciation of this thing because every year we get more students from different areas of the world and it's harder and harder to pronounce all the names. So I try to practice. But with this kid, I didn't have to practice because his name is David Perez. And I'm like, I got when this kid comes to my classroom, he's going to feel at home. I saw that he was from New York. So I imagine he's a New Yorican. You know what that means, right? A, a New Yorker of Puerto Rican descent. So I'm like, yeah. So the day comes and there he is. New York Yankees hat on, little thin beard, good looking guy. He's talking to people, laughing. I'm like, oh, yes, yes. So I go, I take attendance, and then with pride I say, David Perez. And he goes, oh, no, 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 yo, 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 prof. It's Dave Perez. I'm like, what? Dave, what are you talking about? You're David Perez. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't speak no Spanish. So, oh, apparently you don't speak any English either. I'm an English professor. I'm allowed to say that. But here's the thing, all right? I had to respect that that's the way he refers to himself. And I called him Dave Perez. But something about that hurt me. Not that he didn't know Spanish, no. But that there was a hint of shame regarding his Puerto Rican heritage. I remember coming home that night and telling my wife, hey, hon, you know, I have this kid, Dave Perez. Uh, he, nice kid, but he seems to be ashamed of his Latino background. And she says, well, you know what, hon? Two things. First, you are probably the first Latino professor that he's ever had. So you're going to fix that issue of pride immediately after he takes a few classes with you. And second, be tolerant, because if I'm not mistaken, you hated your name growing up. And she, she was right. Growing up in Puerto Rico, I did not like my name, Javier. Why? Javier is a very common name in Puerto Rico. It was, in the 1980s, the second most common name in all of Spain and all Spanish-speaking countries, Javier. So you can imagine that I had four kids named Javier in my class, and I wanted something cooler. So I wanted to be Javi, but there was already a Javi. Javi hurt me in two ways. First, by having that name, and second, by after I was rejected by the girl that I asked to dance, five seconds later, she was dancing with Javi. I have seen Javi on Facebook, and I have won. I'm just saying that. But anyway, going back to, the, to this. I wanted to have a cool, exotic name, like a friend of ours in Puerto Rico. He was uh, from the US, and his name, Sean. Now, you might laugh and think, oh, what are you talking about? But Sean in Puerto Rico is incredibly exotic. S-E-A-N. Oh! And his last name, even more exotic, Roberts. We could not pronounce his name properly at the time. We said, John Robert. And every time he would come over, John Robert viene para acá, John Robert viene acá, John Robert viene para acá. And I wanted to be like John Robert, but I was the very commonly named Javier Avila. Well, be careful what you wish for, because I got my wish. It took me decades, but I got my wish when I moved permanently to Pennsylvania. And at first, it was cute when they say, Oh, the J is like an H, uh-huh, Javi, Javier, oh, yes, yes. Oh, we have a cat named Javier. Jerry Seinfeld's cat is Javier. Oh, great, thank you. And then, after a hundred mispronunciations and misspellings, I decided once again to take it to the page. So I wrote this poem that I'm going to share with you about the trouble with my name, and I hope that if any of you has trouble with your name, you can identify. This is for all the difficultly named people in Nova. The trouble with my name. All my life, I had been mispronouncing my name, which I thought was Javier Avila, until I moved to Pennsylvania to learn linguistics outside the classroom. First came the tennis club experience. Hi, may I help you? The nice lady asked. Yes, I have a court reserved for 2 p.m., I replied. Under what name? Avila. You must mean Avila. 
Yes, that's what I meant. And I thought, how nice of her to teach me the proper pronunciation of my name. It baffled me though, because my publisher has called me Ovala for seven years. My student who wrote Avila on his first paper seemed surprised when I suggested that he look at the syllabus to read the proper spelling of my name. And when he handed in his second paper and said, I got the name right this time, and I saw that he had written Avila again, I told him that we never stop learning. And he grinned as though he had never heard sarcasm before. The police officer who pulled me over for having tinted windows said, I'm going to let this slide because they're not so dark, Mr. Avalar. And when I corrected him, he said, that might be the way Spanish people say it, but this is America. And who am I to tell him that I am not Spanish or that America consists of dozens of countries and in most of them se habla español? The principal of my son's school prides herself in saying the students' names correctly. Therefore, when she said, Mr. Avia, We'd be honored if you could come and read poetry to the children. I naturally accepted, in part because she didn't call me Mr. Avilia like the parent who recommended me did. You see, I like that they have options, that they can be creative, that they will bravely forego looking it up or asking the person who's had the name for 40 years or so. But the real trouble, as it turns out, is my first name. Waiting for my license, the DMV lady yelled, Javier! I had to look around to realize she meant me. When I was hired to teach a writing workshop, my future colleague shook my hand and said, welcome to the department, Javier. It made me feel so nice in French. At a conference, a fellow writer introduced me to his friends as the Puerto Rican poet laureate, Javier. And to hear the first syllable stressed so dactylically transported me to a Longfellow masterpiece. The first time my chiropractor called me Javier, I went through an ethnic crisis, but that was resolved when 10 minutes later the massage therapist said, let's see how much stress you've been holding on to, Javi Ray. And of course, I felt something was fishy when the MC at the poetry festival introduced me as Dr. Caviar. Getting takeout is an issue. When they ask, what's the name? I panic. What should be my takeout alter ego? Even Siri gets confused with me, and we have an intimate relationship. I mean, why go to the gym every day if she insists on calling me heavier? You see, when my friends moved to the States, they became other people instantly without alternate pronunciations. Ivan Velez became Ivan Velez. Joel Ramos became Joel Ramos. And Brenda Aguirre became Brenda Aguirre. I, on the other hand, became many people every day, and I still do. There seems to be no cure for my multiple name pronunciation disorder, but there is a prescription that can heal it, one that must be renewed daily by phone. So every day, I dial the number, the only one I'll always know by heart. And as soon as she answers the phone, I hear my name the way it's supposed to sound, in the voice of my mother. Thank you. If I die from uh, ingesting this water, I want you to know that I really enjoyed my visit to your campus. And that uh, as a last show, I think it's, a, it's fitting. Um, may you, please, Nate, speak at my memorial, please. <laughs> nice things only. Um, my mother, who is going to be 86 years old um, in November, she uh, is a woman with a master's degree a former public school teacher for 35 years in one of the most difficult schools in Puerto Rico, La Escuela Juan Ponce de Leon. Um, a highly accomplished woman, is, and she was the first in her entire family to attend university. Um, but she said, half jokingly, but n not really, that her greatest accomplishment was actually that she was able to cook the rice and beans exactly the way her mother-in-law cooked them. Her mother-in-law, my beloved Abuelita Veneranda. My grandmother was perhaps the most interesting person I have ever met. She lived a long life. She lived to be 103. So she was born in 1898 and died in 2001. 
this woman saw the entire 20th century. And she was larger than life, even though she was only about 4 foot 11 and 80 pounds. And when she smiled, she would light up the room. And you immediately noticed when she smiled that she was missing her four front teeth. She had these big fangs. And with those fangs, she would get a chicken and she would annihilate it. She would suck out the marrow and leave almost no evidence that there was ever any kind of animal there. Oh my God. When she was in her late 90s, she would go to the casinos and uh, in the hotels in San Juan in Puerto Rico and they had an all-you-can-eat buffet right next to the casino and she would bring a big purse, line it with aluminum foil and inside, with no Tupperware, she would put shrimp, steak, rice, slices of pizza and then she would, for three days or so, she would say, here you go, here's some pizza with shrimp, you'll like it. Cometelo, cometelo, and we would eat it. My grandmother, when she was Close to the end, she told me, Javier, one day I want you to know the true story of my life. Because there are things that uh, I did that will shock you. I was too young and foolish to appreciate the gift that she was going to give me. So, I made a joke. I said, what, Grandma, did you get a parking ticket one day? Like, what could she possibly, my little cute grandmother, what could she possibly have done, right? So, many years went by. After she passed, and that's when I became interested. It happens often. We become interested and we attribute value to certain people in our lives after they're gone. Luckily, I had my mother and I asked her, Mommy, ¿qué pasó con abuela? What was her big secret? What was... And my mom says, you really want to know? Sit down, I'll tell you. So I sit down and my mom starts telling me about my grandmother and how she was illegally followed by the FBI for 12 years. I'm like, abuela, a fugitive? She's like, no, not quite a fugitive. She was a Puerto Rican nationalist who was best friends with Don Pedro Albizu Campos, the head of the Puerto Rico Nationalist Party. Back in the day, this man was on the most wanted list of the FBI and my grandmother and many like her who were believed in the independence of Puerto Rico, a twice colonized island, 400 years of Spain and 100 and some years of the United States. My grandmother, when she was in New York City, they have pictures of her, there she is, a file this thick. Then when she was in Bayamón, Puerto Rico, when she lived in Old San Juan, they had all kinds of details of her life, invasion of privacy and so forth. And in the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, all those files are available now. And I was shocked. My grandmother was punished and jailed for doing something that any Puerto Rican in Virginia does, which you know, they show the Puerto Rican flag. Back in the 1950s, there was a gag law that prohibited anyone from displaying the Puerto Rican flag in public. At the same time, my father and his two brothers, my uncles, were all fighting for this country in the Korean War. So there you go. That was my family. We did not talk about those things in our family. Love knows no political boundaries. And all I remember about my grandmother was her incredible wit, her charm, her sense of humor, and the wisdom of some products that we use all the time in Puerto Rico. I would like to share them with the community here at NOVA because I think uh, they're important. Uh, you might think these are American products, but I, 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 these are Latino products, okay? And the first one I'm gonna share with you is of course a Latino product we like to call, how do you say this? Sorry that you're, you're mispronouncing it. It's not Vicks. It's a Big Vaporu, okay? Big Vaporu, Big Vaporu. Uh, some people think this, uh, this sounds like Viva Peru. Viva Peru. Mmm, this is an amazing balm for any flu or cold. You put a little bit on your chest, you put it behind your ears, you put it on the soles of your feet, put socks on. You can put it anywhere except you know where. Don't put it there because it's not going to work there. But anyway, this is the balm of life. There is no proof that this prevents COVID. But... Keep it anyway, all right? Just in case. Vicks will work. It works on the pimples of Latinos. I hear it doesn't work on other ethnicities or races. I don't know why. Here's one. 
Agua Maravilla. This is witch hazel. Everybody knows about witch hazel. But this special witch hazel with the lady is Humphrey's witch hazel. Okay? This is wonderful for bug bites, minor cuts and scrapes, for after shaving, uh, muscle aches. It is phenomenal for battling acne. Here's what you do. You get a pimple. You pop it. Boop. You put a little bit of this on a cotton pad, apply it for one day, on and off. The next day it's gone with humpers. <laughs> it has to be this one. If you get the Dickinson, which is a good brand, the pimple will last an extra day. Don't get the Walmart brand, all right? You're going to get two pimples. Don't do it. Here's a product that perhaps is not available in your uh, grocery stores. This is Alcolado, otherwise known as Bay Rum. It smells interesting. It sanitizes everything. Let me bless, uh, bless those online over there. This is nature's air conditioning. If you're hot, a hot Virginia summer, and you don't have AC, you put a little bit of this behind your neck, you're good to go. My grandmother would drink it. I don't recommend it. it I think it has 70% alcohol, so don't do it. But um, it's also good for any muscle aches. And it is, in the absence of uh, rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizers, back then when we had that crisis, you could guess, get this. This is hand sanitizer. Last but not least, a product that I believe works wonders for those who have arthritis and muscle aches. I know we've heard of Tiger Balm and Ben Gay and Icy Hot. Forget about all that. Why have that when you can have la vaquita? Manteca de ubre, utter butter. Listen to me. You live longer, all right? This utter butter is fantastic. It smells like root beer, mint, and love all mixed together. Uh, if you have arthritis, though, there's a catch. You better have a friend who does not have arthritis because this is almost impossible to open. So you, you, but, but once you open it, it works. But let me tell you, my grandmother, who is right here, I don't know if you can do a close-up for those online, but, but this is when she was young. My abuelita, uh, what I remember the most about her is her cooking. Oh my God, she would cook incredible meals. And you would see her, it didn't look like she was doing much, but whatever she was doing was magic. And when she served us that food, she would leave, she would not eat with us. She would serve me and my brother and my cousin, and she would go to the other room and sit in a chair and then wait to have leftovers that she cooked herself. It was amazing. I go to a Puerto Rican restaurant. It's a Puerto Rican slash Dominican restaurant in Bethlehem. I go there all the time, and I go, I go in. They know what I like. Oh, it's Wednesday. El señor Javier quiere arroz con pollo. And there I am. I sit down, and I heard someone say, oh, aquí está. He, there he is praying again, just because I closed my eyes. I'm not praying. I am time traveling. I am back when I was 12 years old, and my grandmother would cook for us. And I am remembering. So the poem I'm going to read to you now is about my grandmother and her cooking. And this is En Casa de Abuela. Doña Bene, the best cook in San Juan, did not own any measuring cups. Her kitchen was too small to fit two people. And when she seasoned the food, it appeared as though she threw spice after spice, leaves and sofrito randomly into the old pots and pans. Her freezer housed the snow that afflicts old appliances. On the countertops, a glass jar with reused oil beside a clogged strainer would terrify anyone interested in longevity. And there she was, 90 years old, dark, minuscule, and hunched in her lavender sleeping gown, flattening plantains, mixing reca with red bell peppers, flashing a nearly toothless smile that would look like a vagrant if she were on the street. And then she would serve us on the cobalt blue plates, steamy white rice, red beans, chicken fricasse, tostones, a slice of avocado from the tree that she planted in her youth. 
and she reminded us that there was flan de coco for dessert. Eat everything, she said, as she walked to the living room to sit on her red armchair and rub witch hazel on her legs. We devoured the meal. We always did, knowing once again that despite what anyone would say, we were never poor. Thank you. When you know where you come from, you know who you are, you're always rich. Um, I'm just uh, hearing a message that everyone attending this event will get genuine rice and beans cooked and delivered to your residence, courtesy of, is it the provost's office? Or diversity and inclusion? I don't know. I got to get the details later, but uh, contact uh, Dr. Carter <coughs> for this. <laughs> um, all right. I'd like to thank Nate and uh, the, the provost and everyone who is here. Um, thank you all for being here. It's, it's an honor. I know that it's, it's a rare thing to do a live event. I'm still, um, I was doing this for so long, then I had to stop and do it virtually and only have this much space to move. So I'm learning, I'm relearning to move on the stage now. But it's a wonderful thing, and I hope that you have a, a great academic year. Um, my son is 11 years old now, and uh, he, he knows very well who he is because we always uh, portrayed ourselves uh, three-dimensionally. We, we never hid his Puerto Rican history. We always talked about it, so he, he's well acquainted with it. And um, when he had to do an oral presentation when he was in first grade about his uh, roots, he said, Daddy, is it okay if I borrow your Puerto Rican flag? And I said, I don't know. Are you, are you sure? No, no, it's, it's, for, it's for an oral presentation about who I am. And uh, I said, well, don't get it dirty. Don't let it hit the floor. I'm like, no, no, it's going to be fine. So I didn't get to see him in the classroom, of course, but I saw him practice in his little bedroom. And he has a little mirror in front of him. He puts the flag, wraps it around his shoulders, and he says, Hello, I am Oscar Avila. I am from Pennsylvania, and I am Puerto Rican. And you see, to him, that is a normal thing. That is just him saying who he is. But to me, that meant the world. Because that is a reality that we are all trying to learn that he already knows, which is that you can be a proud American and a proud Puerto Rican. You can be a proud American, and a proud Mexican, proud American, proud Italian, and so forth. You can embrace the cultures, the languages, the history that shaped your ancestry and shaped who you are. Embrace it, and you will be no less American. Quite the contrary. You will be exactly the way this country was supposed to be. And that's what makes our country wonderful. So he doesn't understand the power that that had on me. And because of that moment, I decided to write him a poem so that he would know where he comes from. And I wrote about his four great-grandmothers and what I believe is the future of this country. So I'm going to read this last poem. And then after that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so this I'd like to dedicate to all of you here today in Annandale. This is Bloodline. Abuela Bene, the daughter of a former slave and her owner, married a Spaniard who became a Puerto Rican nationalist. And together, amid the dangers of Albizu's battles, they had three sons, the youngest of which, Alfonso, treasured me the way I treasure you. You carry the heart of West Africa, the might of Spain, the dream of independence in your veins. Abuela Juana, whose parents can be traced back to the natives who greeted Columbus, married Gracia, a blue-eyed campesino. And of their 11 children, my mother, Josefina, the first to attend college, would sweat through a two-hour commute on three buses in the sweltering heat of the tropics to become a teacher. The nobility of the Taino and the grit of the Jibaro shine in you. Great-grandma Bernadine, 
daughter of Austro-Hungarian immigrants who severed their Slavic roots amid the turmoil of war, lost her husband as a young mother and raised her three children by herself. Her oldest, Nancy, who cultivated kindness from the hardship of scarcity, gave birth to your mother. The resilience of the Slovak who survived against the odds, against the elements, propels you. Great-grandma Genevieve, Irish, life of the party, and your Polish-American great-grandfather, a mailman like my father, taught Grandpa Joe, the oldest of seven, the meaning of honest work, and within you, the unyielding spirit of Ireland and the fortitude of Poland coexist. A convergence of countries has shaped your history. Some roads that led you here were paved with blood, most often shed in vain. Up north, brave women and brave men fled the only worlds they knew in search of something better for their children. Toward the island, it was a different journey for the conquistadores who ravaged, built, and altered a land that they would lose after 400 years to a country that still cannot understand the splendor of our race, the anarchy of hearts that ache for sovereignty, a state that can't be found. Our people are all from somewhere else, but they are all from here. From the treacherous distances they traveled with the courage to build another legacy, unquestionably something has emerged, and that, my son, is hope. You are every slave who worked the fields and dreamt of being free. Every Irishman and Pole who was spat on by immigrants who came before them and by each other, weathering unmerciful winters, breaking their backs, working the mines and farms. You are every newcomer who changed his name to assimilate, who disposed of his native language to assimilate, who was told that being an American is to assimilate, who by stripping his heritage and grieving it in silence, waited for the warmth of equal treatment. You are every Puerto Rican who left the sugarcane field for a mainland factory job making lowly wages and awaiting equal treatment from fellow American citizens who refuse to see. You, hijo, are every tear of the Taino whose land was ripped away by greed, disease, and hate. You are all of them, their truth and the distortions of their truth. The centuries, the continents, the ocean seas and rivers that flow into your being and reflect the rainbow that has spread into your eyes, where in chaotic harmony they celebrate at last, and in a multitude of languages they scream, I am the future of America, I am the future of America, I am the future of America. When you see me, you'll see yourself. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I'm reading Gloria Anzaldúa with my students, and so we've wrestled with the language, and uh, we talked a lot about gender, but I wonder if you could speak on gender as a part of your experience. Well, the, the, the expectation of the culture where I come from is that, that men don't talk about their issues at all, and, which is why I did not know the reality of my dad's suffering, because he never talked about it with anyone. I had to learn after the fact. And I think it's, it's a tragedy that, uh, that that part of the culture of, uh, of men who, who are supposed to keep their pain completely um, secret from their families. I think it would have helped him a lot. He may have lived a longer life. He died at 65. Um, uh, several issues that he had, but I think he would have lived a longer life had he been able to communicate more and be more open about things. Um, so there's that issue. Um, uh, societal expectations are, are interesting in Puerto Rico. My wife lived in Puerto Rico for a while as, as a white uh, American woman who spoke very little Spanish. She found a few things fascinating, such as uh, the way that you know, Puerto Rican women are expected to be employed. Uh, and she, she found it fascinating that 
in, in Pennsylvania, people would ask her, oh, are you working? In Puerto Rico, they would ask her, where are you working? Because it's like automatic that you're, you're going to be working. Um, but there's subtle differences, expectations and differences. But ultimately, I've noticed that uh, um, all cultures have uh, uh, ways to go in terms of uh, an egalitarian society, but we're getting there. I think some things are better over there, some things are not. Uh, but yeah, and then if you're asking about the pronouns, in Puerto, not, not pronouns in Puerto Rico, but uh, the endings of words, if words are masculine or feminine, that's a whole different thing. I think that if you're an English speaker, you have more of a problem with some words being masculine or feminine than uh, in, if you're a Spanish speaker, because you realize that la vida is a feminine word, life is feminine, el tiempo is masculine. And then you realize that a lot of terms are interchangeable and people are not really thinking about gender as much. But of course, inclusive language, as long as it's uh, uh, done for the right reasons, not for the trendy reasons, but for the right reasons, uh, which is to treat everyone uh, equally and with uh, uh, the way we treat minorities matters because we all will become minorities at some point, whether it's uh, a, a, you're the only man in a, in a, in a woman-dominated field or vice versa, or you have an injury and now you need um, uh, equity. Um, the way we treat minorities says so much about it. But my God, that was a long answer that I gave you, um, which I don't even remember your question now. Thank you so much. That was really, really great. Um, I actually resonated with a lot of the things that you said, but one other thing that was intriguing was when you mentioned your experience with your name and the only person that pronounced it correctly is your mom, which is similar to me. <laughs> so can you really elaborate on that journey of really discovering that identity as an immigrant in the United States? Well, the thing is, your name matters, and uh, it's been uh, studied that the, the, the most pleasant uh, sound for a human being is someone else who matters to them saying their name. And you start feeling like a stranger in your own life when no one can say your name the way that you are so used to saying. Uh, my nickname, because I'm Javier Enrique, my nickname for the longest time was Quique, Q-U-I-Q-U-E. And I grew up and everyone just knew Kiki. I didn't even use Javier. Oh, and at school, I buried Javier. I thought, I don't want to be Javier anymore. I'm Kike. But then I had a girlfriend when I was like in my early 20s who said, oh, Kike is for a, for a child. You're Javier. And I agreed, and I stopped using Kike. Um, and I felt weird. And now, if someone says Kike, I know that it's home, and I feel it. So your name means home. So that's why other people can say my name, but you know when my mother says Enrique or Kike or, or Javier or Javi, it's it's special. Um, but you have to you also have to understand the other side, and uh, some people cannot say certain words. I can roll my R's easily. If my name were Ramon, I cannot expect someone who does not speak Spanish, who cannot roll the R's, to say Ramon. The best I can hope for, for is that they'll say Ramon. And I have to understand, listen, I can't force you, I can't get mad. Imagine if I got mad every day that someone doesn't say Ramon, you know? I would be living a really sad life. So you have to understand, people are doing their best. Most people are not living a life to hurt you or to diminish you. They're doing their best. So uh, there are times when you can talk to people about things, but other than that, many things have to be let go if you are to move forward. The people who matter in your life, those people should say your name right. But that's a handful of people. You know, Facebook would have you believe you have 2,000 friends, but the reality is you have about five or eight friends. I don't know why I skipped from five to eight, but anyway. But thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, I have a book that has the poems from the show, and then I have a, a novel in Spanish, it's a thriller, and a novel in English is called Different, and that's the one that was made into a movie, and the movie is Miente, which is available on online for free. But I highly recommend that you read the book first, and then watch the movie. All right. Thank you for joining us to watch The Trouble With My Name, performed by Dr. Javier Avila 
This has been a DEI Spotlight performance sponsored by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, brought to you live here from the Annandale campus. Uh, we appreciate you taking your time to watch this performance, and we look forward to hosting more DEI Spotlight events. You can see those on the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion website under DEI Spotlight Event. Um, have a great rest of your day. Have a wonderful Hispanic Heritage Month, and we will see you again for another DEI Spotlight performance soon. Thank you.